engagement for historians of medicine needs, quite recently, since the Philippines has well, some remarkable changes. <laughs> but let's not worry. Doctors dissenting against dictatorship, medicine, martial law, and Marcos in the Philippines, 1972-1986. Welcome, Francis. The floor is all yours. Thank you. Okay. Maraming salamat. Uh, thank you, Hans. Um, when I, res I submitted my abstract to apply to participate in this conference, I simply wanted to be part of a panel. And I was pleasantly surprised to learn and to receive the, the email message from Hans, um, inviting me to serve as the keynote, though I really felt I don't deserve to be considered a keynote speaker. I was humbled and honored to be part of HOMC for the past decade or so. And as Hans mentioned, when HOMC came to Manila, we were glad to welcome um, a lot of scholars. And it's an opportunity right now to have some sort of a reunion of sorts uh, for a number of us. And also an opportunity to meet new friends and colleagues uh, whom I would like to um, discover um, with your own personal research projects. Let me begin with um, the great Asian tradition of uh, making an apology, particularly to Michelle. <laughs> this was a paper actually that was developed um, with a project that Michelle and Hans and the others uh, from Home C spearheaded, but because of the political events and social um, um, challenges that we encountered in the Philippines, I failed to submit the paper on time. Hence, this presentation. Thank you, Michelle, and again, my apologies. So let me begin uh, my paper. On September 21, 1972, then Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos declared the entire archipelago under martial law. The period ushered in a new era in the political history of post-war Philippines. For the first time since the granting of independence, the formal political institutions of the country were reconfigured under what was termed by the regime as constitutional authoritarianism that brought the country into a period that he labeled as the new society. This was justified by Marcos himself as a means, and I quote, to save the Republic from the imminent dangers of what he termed a subversion, rebellion, and the threats coming from the oligarchic right, and that's his term, and the communist left, also his favorite term. What transpired after 1972 was actually the extension of Marcosian rule. The rule was constitutionally prohibited to be extended beyond 1973 by way of the abolition of the Philippine Senate and the House of the Representatives, the abolition of the Constitution, the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, and the appointment of close friends and relatives to positions of power and authority without the scrutiny of the Commission on Appointments. Most especially, it was a period of the control of mass media, educational institutions, and the establishment of propaganda machineries for the regime. Workers were prohibited from exercising their right to unionize, or even, uh, of course, the right to strike, uh, particularly for specific industries and areas. The suspension of local and national elections was held, and the abolition of political parties. The consolidation of Marcos martial law was supported by what then developed as the pillars of Marcosian power. American government support, control of the military institutions, development of pre-market economic policies by way of technocrats and economy supportive of IMF and World Bank programs, and the expansion of the economic interests of cronies, family members, and close relatives with business interests 
in the country. The period, however, should not be viewed as a unique historical phenomenon in the Philippines. At the height of the Cold War, pro-American regimes in Asia, Africa, and Latin America also followed the same pattern of authoritarian consolidation as a means to contain communist, and I quote, communist influence and expansion. The historical experiences in Indonesia, South Korea, Taiwan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Brazil, Chile, Argentina, Dominican Republic, Kenya, Uganda, among others, were comparative examples of post-independence, Cold War, US-backed US right-wing dictatorships that defined the contours of modern political histories of some nations in the global south. And I would like to present this as a perspective from that community of nations called the global south. One particular arena that went unnoticed in the whole history of Cold War authoritarian political consolidation was the area of medicine, public health, and welfare. In the Philippines, the establishment of medical facilities and health institutions with magnificent architecture and art were touted by Marco supporters as part of the achievements of new society. That mantra. He actually launched his campaign by, by way of uh, the slogan, this nation can be great again which will be used, of course, in the recent political histories of other nations. Imelda Marcos, the wife of the dictator, was instrumental in the construction of medical facilities and institutions during this period. The Philippine Heart Center for Asia, the Lung Center of the Philippines, the Kidney Transplant Center, the Lungsod ng Kabataan Children's Medical City, as well as the expansion of the uh, Philippine General Hospital were regarded as achievements of the new society regime. Aside from these, the Population Center, the Nutrition Center, the Research Institute for Tropical Medicine funded by Japanese ODA, and the Expanded Medical Care Commission were also established and heralded as part of the, in quote, benevolent programs of the Marcoses under Imelda's mantra of what should be the true the good and the beautiful. The establishment of the Ministry of Human Settlements was also a project of the government to address what it termed as the 11 basic needs of man, essentially focusing on social services like health, education, housing, nutrition, among others. The expansion, consolidation, and institutionalization of local government authority in the metropolitan area of Manila by way of Metro Manila Commission was also touted as a means to deliver these basic services of what Imelda would term as her city of man. But beyond the rhetoric of the glorious and glossy achievements of Marcos and Marcia Lloyd in the Philippines, actual health, welfare, and economic data of the period provide a different picture of what was happening in the ground. For example, the Philippines ratio was eight nurses for every 10,000 people during this period. Canada had 57, West Germany 27, the United States 49. Of the nurses working in the Philippines, only approximately one third served in the rural areas. The two thirds are in Manila or in other big cities. This small distribution resulted in an even more imbalanced nurse to patient ratio of one nurse for every 33,000 people. For the economy, between 1965 and 1985, the daily wages of urban skilled workers fell by 68.5% and of urban unskilled workers by 72.4% according to the top uh, alternative economy, Sunny Africa. For wage earners in agriculture, there was a 21.4 drop over the same period. Unemployment was uh, from 3.9% in 1975 to 7.9% 7 in 1980 and 12.6% in 1985. These Marcosian projects that I mentioned before sought, of course, funding 
from the necessary funding from its conventional financiers and backers, most importantly the World Bank and IMF. Backed by Washington's uh, foreign policy, the Imelda Marcos biographers uh, would mention that the World Bank and international commercial banks proceeded with a massive lending program from a meager 165.1 million in 1974, World Bank assistance to the Philippines ballooned to 13.6 billion in 1983. Before martial law, the country was the 30th among the League of Borrowers of the Bank's funds. By 1980, it ranked eighth highest among 113 third world countries. Foreign public debt grew from 460 million in 19. 65 to 19.3 billion in 1985, according to Sunny Africa. From 1966 to 1985, the Marcos regime entered into 13 standby agreements, an extended fund facility and a compensatory financing facility with the IMF, and had 91 loans to the World Bank with a value of 4.3 billion. The, current, the, the country's foreign debt only, in, uh, only increased from 599 million in, uh, uh, in 1965 to 2.1 billion in 1973, but then increased rapidly from 4.9 billion to 24.7 billion between 1974 to 1982. It grew further to 26.4 billion by 1985. Of course, other than these, some of the sources of funding came from US military assistance. Sorry, this was supposed to be the last, the, for the last slide. US military assistance grew from 13.1 million in 1972 to 25 million in 1985, with a total uh, military assistance of 17.2 million in 1972 to 19, 1985's 85 million. The Ministry of Human Settlements under Imelda Marcos appoint, was appointed to implement the $200 million economic support fund, which was part of the 500 million being paid by the United States for the rental of the bases for the period 1979 to 1984. Cronyism was also rampant. According to uh, the author Ricardo Manapat in his famous book, Some Are Smarter Than Others, Pacifico Marcos, the brother of uh, Ferdinand Marcos, was also instrumental in all of this. The Medical Care Commission of the Philippines was expanded during this period by way of Pacifico Marcos. Pacifico's official position in the government bureaucracy was chairman of the Medicare, the, the agency in charge of the highly criticized health program of the government. When the program was instituted, according to Manapat, shortly before martial law was imposed and a compulsory contribution from every wage earner required, many labor groups demonstrated in the streets and criticized the moves as another form of undue taxation denouncing the scheme as yet another way to extract from their hard-earned money. Worker groups argued that the scheme would not bring to them any real health benefits and would only dig more deeply into their already hurting pockets. Remember the decrease in real wages and the high unemployment rate. In the years that the medical program was in place, no worker received either in terms of actual health or material benefits, the amount which had been deducted from his salary. This, however, was only one side of the story. Doctors complained as well that they were not being paid their proper professional dues from the Medicare fund. Dr. Pacifico Marcos, uh, the younger brother, has the distinction also of personally accumulating one of the longest lists of corporations among the presidential relatives. Pacifico was chairman of several companies and ventured uh, into almost every conceivable area of business activity, insurance, mining, real estate management, management consultancy, sugar, car, hotels, 
tours, banking, agribusiness, publishing, and general management. Financing these government projects was also sourced from labor export. Contemporary migration is a central component uh, uh, of labor of export-led development strategy implemented in the Philippines through the intervention of the IMF and World Bank. In 1974, the government created the Overseas Employment Development Board. This agency publicized the availability of Filipino labor in overseas market, evaluated overseas employment contracts, and recruited Filipino laborers. Uh, to work abroad. This was the government's manpower exchange program, according to Ruby Pareñas. Uh, in the Philippines, its goals were the development, promotion, and regulation of overseas employment. Government ministers and President Marcos himself canvassed for the importation of Filipino workers into the Middle East and other Asian countries, Europe, the United States, and Canada. By the time Marcos was deposed in 1986, export-led development was so well in place in the economic infrastructure of the Philippines that the successors have continued to depend on the exportation, not of goods, but of labor, to sustain the economy. Without the labor out-migration, out according again to Ru Ruby Pareñas, the, uh, uh, the rate of unemployment would increase by approximately 40%. For the medical profession since the early 70s, the Marcos government, for example, began to actively promote the export of Filipino nurses and other Filipino laborers abroad. This new commitment to an export-oriented economy transport, uh, transformed the relationship between medical care, nursing, and nation building in the Philippines. Filipino nurses, and medical care workers working abroad would become the new national heroes through the remittance of desperately needed foreign currency in the Philippines. What were financed amidst all of these financial constraints were the designer hospitals, uh, some historians called it, um, and showcase projects. So you have this magnificent architecture as examples. According to historian Michael Pante, clustered in Quezon City's Diliman Quadrangle, state-built designers, designer hospitals such as the National Kidney and Transplant Institute, the Philippine Heart Center, the Lung Center of the Philippines, the Philippine Children's Hospital dominated the landscape of this part of the metropolis. Filipinos jokingly called this cluster of hospitals, according to Pante, the BOPIS complex in refer reference to the local dish called bopis made of pork innards. The humor in this phrase is multi-layered as it also hints that as the Marcos's vampirish nature like an aswang or a benevolent, malevolent blood-sucking folkloric creature feeding off the people's internal organs like the lungs, the heart, and the kidneys. The ultimate joke, according to Pante, however, was on the Filipino taxpayer. Rather than devote state resources to community medicine, emailed um, to or address diseases that plague majority of the Filipino, ordinary Filipinos, emailed the favored boutique hospitals to promote medical tourism. Despite massive funding coming from foreign loans and government pension service, only a few could avail of these hospital services. In 1986, at the time of the ouster of the Marcoses, the Lung Center had only one patient. While the Philippine General Hospital, the go-to hospital for many low-income Manila residents, suffered substandard facilities. The, the Heart Center was rushed for completion in 1975, and the date was, of course, February 14. Valentine's Day. It was touted to be emailed as gift for Asia, gift of love for Asia. It was sophisticated, was a sophisticated medical unit, according to journalist Raisa Robles. But our main killers are dysentery, gastroenteritis, and tuberculosis. And these are better fought with clean water and sewage system, and above all, with better food. The heart center up absorbed, unfortunately, 50% of the budget for health. According to 
the architect Gerard Lico, there were also other plans that were never materialized. A $60 million Philippine Medical Research Center at the University of the Philippines campus uh, was another Imelda project geared towards health research and medical sciences. The project, which never materialized, was supposed to be built on a 50-hectare site and would include a 1,500-bed teaching and research hospital and a complex of building for the health sciences. The first lady, through the architect Jorge Ramos, also took up renovation and expansion of the Philippine General Hospital at the lower right of the screen to upgrade facilities of public medical institutions. The first phase of the PGH was constructed within uh, the timetable to be inaugurated on the 2nd of July. Of course, the 2nd of July was the birthday of Imelda. Uh, and Imelda Marcos herself was the chair of the Philippine General Hospital Foundation. As a way to control urban population, the Population Center uh, was established in 1974. The cost of construction was partly funded by the Rockefeller Foundation and the USAID, according to architect Gerard Lico. And you have all of these, not only designer buildings, but art. You can see the mural at the Philippine Heart Center. The name of the mural was Inang Bayan or Mother Nation, but you can see the resemblance of the one in the middle to Imelda Marcos. This was made by the National Ar Artist for Painting, Vicente Manansala. Um, and the plaque is still there. Um, Imelda Marcos was touted to have said, be there but one Filipino sick and uh, uncared for. Our mission is not done. Imelda's Metro Manila Commission had managed to accumulate $1.99 billion in debts, billion dollars, uh, or sorry, billion pesos in debts, or approximately $150 million in its 10 years of existence. She was um, governor, governor of Metro Manila, Minister of Human Settlements, Chair of the Marcosian Cabinet Committee, and Member of the Parliament. He, she also served as chair or board member to 51 foundations and corporations, including the Philippine General Hospital Foundation, the different boards of the designer hospitals no, and institutions. According to Ricardo Manapat, uh, in his book, Some Are Smarter Than Others, there is the real score, the underside of martial law and medicine in the Philippines. This was the picture of Joel Abong, uh, uh, the, the child who died of malnutrition when famine struck the central island of Negros in 1985. And I would like to quote Manapat uh, directly. The extreme poverty and malnutrition experienced by Filipinos are far further compounded by poor health, a deficient health system, the lack of proper sanitation system, system, inadequate clothing and housing, and a neglected educational system, and the lack of employment opportunities. So, so much of the 11 basic needs for the city of man. The Philippines has the highest rate of rates for whooping cough, diphtheria, and rabies in the world. It has also one of the highest rates for leprosy. It has the highest rates in the entire Western Pacific region for tuberculosis, cystosomiasis, and polio. During this time, around 17 million Filipinos, or 32.4% of the total population, suffer from tuberculosis. This means that the Philippines has one of the highest tuberculosis infection rates in the world, accounting for about 40% of all tuberculosis deaths in Southeast Asia. The majority of the diseases, according to Manampat, are from causes which can easily be prevented. According to one source, contaminated water causes 80% of these diseases. The leading cause of death over the past 20 years, on the other hand, were diseases directly attributable to poverty and malnutrition. According to the UNICEF, 200,000 Filipino children die every year because of diarrhea and communicable diseases. The number of babies who die before they reach a full year was 51.7 deaths for every 1,000 in 1978. 
Many of these deaths were due to pneumonia, gastroenteritis, bronchitis, uh, vitaminosis, and other nutritional deficiencies. 70% of rural Filipinos die without even seeing a doctor, not because of the scarcity of competent health professionals, but because only 30 only 3% rather, sorry, of total physicians devote themselves to public health. 68% of doctors emigrate to work abroad, representing a drain of hundreds of millions of dollars in medical training. The remaining 29% devote themselves to lucrative private practice serving the affluent elites of Manila and other big cities. There is only one dentist for every 24,000 persons, and there is only one nurse available for every 27 to 30,000 people in the Philippines. At, and yet the Philippines continues uh, to export 88% of her nurses during this period. A 1980 survey of health facilities showed that most are substandard. 80% of medical centers, 70% of emer emergency hospitals, and 30% of general hospitals did not meet the minimum uh, uh, WHO requirements. The hospital bed to population ratio was 1 to 650. The highest share ever allocated for the Filipinos was only 4 pesos and 30 centavos for every 100 pesos of the national budget. In countries like Indonesia, Hong Kong, and Singapore, her health outlays range from 7 to 10 percent of the total national budget, according to Ebon database in 1983. For every 3 pesos of the health budget, 2 pesos go to curative hospitals or medical services, and only 1 peso goes to preventive diseases, uh, preventive services rather, like immunization. In 1984, for every 42.56 pesos worth of health services, every Filipino may also expect at least 122 pesos and 38 centavos of military service funds and give up 220 pesos and 65 uh, centavos for debt servicing, servicing or loan repayment. At the end of 1982, there were 1,217 private hospitals with a bed capacity of 43,031 and only 509 government hospitals with a bed capacity of 37,434 for a population of more than 50 million. Ironically, the Philippines was the 14th largest force food producer in the world in the early 1980s. The food sector output was 24.6 billion pesos remaining as the country's top producer. But most of these food uh, items were exported and it totaled $693 million in, of which $254 million went to the American market, making that country the largest market for this Philippine product line. The Philippines spends an average of $150 million a year for drug importation, and the country pays as much as 767% to 1,328% more than other countries are paying for the same drugs. The Philippine market for manufactured drugs has become the 10th largest in Asia and the Pacific, according to the same Ebon report. In the rural areas where 70% of the population live, only one health personnel for every uh, 20,000 people was serving this. So this was the real score, the underside of martial law and medicine, which prompted uh, some medical health workers and professionals, as well as com community organizers, to act accordingly. And this happened. This is the second portion of my presentation. This was the period of uh, political and social engagements of progressive um, medical organizations that were organized to address the disparity between what the government would mention as its achievements in the field of health and medical uh, service and the actual reality of medical conditions in the Philippines. 
So we have the Samahan ng Makabayang Scientifico or the Organization of Nationalist Scientists, the Liga ng, mga agham, ng Agham para sa Bayan, the Science League for the Nation, Progresibong Kilusang Medical, the Progressive Medical Movement, the Makabayang Samahang Pangkalusugan, the Nationalist Organization for Health Workers, or MASAPA, which went underground and joined the National Democratic Front together the, with the Liga ng Maagham sa Bayan. The Klinika ng Bayan, or the Nation's Clinic, was a rural health delivery program launched by alternative doctors and medical professionals in the activist circle later on to be organized as part of the Medical Action Group. You also have the launching of medical-based, community-based health programs. Uh, some of them were launched by, with the assistance of church institutions, like the Rural Missionaries of the Philippines, the National Economic Health Concerns of the National Council of Churches in the Philippines, and the Council of Primary Health Care. But it was also the period of intense political engagement and community service by some of the more notable, um, we consider heroes of the period. And I will uh, try to discuss them one by one. Um, from the entries of the Bantayog ng Mga Bayani or the Heroes Memorial, uh, we have the following, Remberto de la Paz, in the 1970s, De La Paz was a student activist in UP Diliman and later in medical school. He joined the Samahan ng Makabayang Scientifico and Liga ng Mga Agham para sa Bayan, the organizations I mentioned before, and took part in the first quarter storm of 1970 and the Diliman Commune of the University of the Philippines in 1971. At the UP College of Medicine, he contributed articles to the letter, newsletter UP Medics and joined the Progressibong Kilusang Medical and helped organize the Medical Student Society and volunteered in the college's outreach program called the Klinika ng Bayan, the one I mentioned before. He, he spent his required six month rural medical work in Samar, one of the poorest provinces in the Philippines, where he saw the dark reality into which Ferdinand Marcos's one man rule had plunged the province. He saw According to the report, besides extreme poverty, widespread mal maltreatment, and abuse of citizens, it was a place where medical services were badly needed. Upon becoming a full-fledged doctor in 1978, he returned to the province, uh, Samar province, with his wife, another, uh, herself uh, a new physician, Dr. Silvia de la Paz. The couple set up a community-based health program and their first clinic was in the far-flung town of Gandara in Samar. It was open to everyone. Using the primary health care approach, the De La Paz couple went to remote villages to attend to the sick, teach first aid, basic hygiene, and nutrition to community health workers. He used appropriate technology with herbal medicine and acupuncture. And I will mention this over and over again for the other medical professionals. And he even assembled an acupuncture oscillator made from local materials at minimal cost to be of service to the community. The martial law regime unfortunately took note of the couple's activities and they were labeled as subversives and communist symp sympathizers. Threats to their safety became more and more apparent and friends and relatives urged them to leave Gandara. They did move, but only to the nearby Katbalogan city, also in Samar, where they, were, where they resumed their work. He was quoted as saying, I, I am a doctor and the only thing I should fear is not being a good one, end of, end of quote. He explained, the people paid for our education just as much as our families, and we should share our knowledge and skills with them. Many poor people came to the De La Paz Clinic for treatment, and some may have been members, really, of the New People's Army operating in the area. Invariably, they left with added, added knowledge and skills. As a doctor, Bobby De La Paz refused to limit himself only to treating diseases. Instead, he went to the people and lived with them. And in the process, witnessing the effects of an unjust system upon the health and lives of poor communities, especially the children. 
Unfortunately, De La Paz was assassinated by a gunman on April 23, 1982, while he was working in the clinic. He was 29 years old. Barely 12 hours after the doctor died, Colonel Hernani Figueroa, the intelligence chief of the Eastern Command, announced over the radio that members of the New People's Army killed Bobby De La Paz. He also warned that anyone saying the military was responsible for the doctor's death would be charged with rumor mongering. The case remained unresolved up to now. Johnny Escandor. Escandor was a graduate of the University of the Philippines College of Medicine. He started at the radiology department of the UP Philippine, Gen Philippine General Hospital, becoming chief resident in 1971, and eventually consultant. He then headed the research department of the Cancer Institute of the Philippines in 1972, and taught at the University of the Philippines College of Medicine. When martial law was declared in 1972, he left behind a promising career to go underground. According to the Bantayog ng Mga Bayani entry, he volunteered to serve in the rural areas in Cagayan Valley. The regime issued a 180,000 peso reward for the ca capture of what, he, uh, uh, what was termed as the NPA, or New People's Army Doctor. He was founding member of the militant student organization, the Kabataang Makabayan, and became active in the Workers' Bureau. He organized institution, institutional health workers and unionized uh, them at the Philippine General Hospital. And he also worked uh, with urban poor communities. He spearheaded the formation of the Progressivum Kilusang Medical or the Progressive Medical Soci Society. When Mark, the first quarter storm erupted in 1972, he was at the forefront of mass actions. He was again very active in the 1972 Operation Tulong, or assistance, which brought medical services to the flood victims in central Luzon. According to the journalist Raisa uh, Robles, the, killing, the case in the killing of cancer specialist Dr. Juan Escandor on March 31, 1983 was a case in point. The Peace Philippine Constabulary Metropolitan Command told his family he was shot during an encounter with government troops along Bohol Avenue in Quezon City. The official police autopsy report of Johnny Escandor's body concluded that, the, that he had bled to death from gunshot wounds. But what the family later on found out was, as, uh, was shocking, and I would like to apologize for the gory details. According to the Commission on Human Rights report, his brother Irineo noticed a bullet entry wound below the ear, indicating that Johnny was shot at close range. Bruises covered parts of his face and body. Patches of his mustache were plucked. There were cigarette burns on his face, and his right eye was gouged out, leaving the eyelid conspicuously depressed. Johnny's corpse bore evidence of brutal torture. A pathologist revo discovered revolting proof that before he died, Escandor had been tortured. He found that trash, plastic bags, dirty rags, and a pair of briefs were shoved inside his skull, while his brains were found inside his abdominal cavity. His internal organs suffered from hemorrhage and hematoma, and X-ray results showed fractures of the occipital bone in the area where his brother noticed a bullet entry wound. To the pathologist, Johnny's cause of death was due to cranio-cerebral injury. There were also other individuals whom I would like to call the non-doctor doctors. They were not doctors by profession or, profession or training, but they were equally important in the campaign for medical uh, service. The Palabay brothers, Armando and Romulo and Crisanto, were student activists at the time when martial law was declared. Uh, when, in 1972, martial law was imposed, Romulo was arrested together with his brother Crisanto and other activists. 
a third brother, Armando, was arrested later and they joined the two Palabay brothers in detention in Camp Olivas. All three underwent torture. They were released a year later under a presidential amnesty. Romulo and his wife, a nursing student, late, uh, left home later to move to the mountain areas of the Cordilleras where they helped organize the Igorot people, the indigenous community of the, of the region, to fight against the dictatorship. It helped very much that they both had some medical knowledge. Romulo, in particular, knew how to administer acupuncture, acupuncture treatments, and use herbal medicine. With this, they were able to successfully treat some cases, which assured a warm welcome in the mountain villages for the group. Soon, the people would start calling him doctor or doctor. Armando Palabay died in a remote area in the mountains of Abra on November 14, 1974. Later, that, less than a month later, his brother Romulo was also killed, this time in another mountain range in Ufugao. Some were really very gory. These were risky times for, for, for the Palabay brothers. Constabulary troops hunted Armando, Crisanto, and their group, killing them and their companions, burying them all together in an unmarked grave near the banks of the Abra River. Up to now, uh, their bodies are, uh, have yet to be found. Ruben Lunas. It's quite funny because Lunas in Tagalog means cure for the sick. Ruben Lunas was on the Diliman campus of the University of the Philippines and was part of the group that found, found, that found out to the neighboring communities of Old Balara and Cruz Naligas. There they started the nursery school for the kids, some of them children of the working people in the university. They even had the proper syllabus. Lunas would sing and play on his guitar, change, changing some words in the simple songs to convey a hidden message. Then a second nursery was started in another community. He went underground and practiced acupuncture and community-based health program um, immediately afterwards. In June 12 of 1975, Lunas was killed by constabulary troopers in the southern Luzon province of Albay. He would have escaped with his life if he had not rushed back to retrieve his acupuncture kit which he had been using to treat the ailments of the local residents. The little thin needles were important for him in serving people. Jennifer Carino was a bright young woman who during her short life did more than her share in strengthening the unity of the Cordillera indigenous peoples, notably through her cultural work. Actually, Carino be belonged to a well-known Ibaloy clan her grandfather was the first Igorot mayor of Baguio City. On the other hand, her mother was also part of a large, well-known cl clan originating in Cebu. It was in high school that the young Carino first publicly stood up for the Igorot pride. In an article published in the student organ, she criticized the discrimination against the Cordillera Highland tribes, recalling their proud history of resistance. Giving birth in 1972 and caring for her baby girl, Carino experienced the hardships endured by many other parents unable to provide a safe and stable environment for their families. Her husband was imprisoned and she could not visit her for fear of being arrested herself. In 1974, she finally decided to leave the child with her family and work with the resistance organization in the Cordillera Mountains. The area between Ifugao and Benguet provinces was one of the most depressed areas in the region. There was a lot of things to do as members of the tribe who lived there had very few material resources. And visiting their settlements meant very long, arduous treks al uh, along the mountain trails. Carino wrote songs, con conducted literary lessons, applied acupuncture therapy, and used herbal medical treatment. Sadly, Carino died at the age of 26 when she was hit by a stray bullet um, while in the mountains. Jessica Sales. 
With fellow teachers, Jessica conducted discussion groups tackling issues concerning teachers and teaching at the University of the Philippines campus in Los Baños. Often the discussion centered on how to make teaching more relevant despite the curtailment of freedoms under martial law. She became involved with the, Philipp the, with the Philippine Folk Medicine Society, which counted as members doctors, nurses, sociologists, biology professors, and students, and the community of folk healers, or El Bolarios, in Laguna and Batangas. She was never a doctor, she was a sociologist, but you know, belonging to the society, she, she claimed that the society claimed to revive and popularize traditional and herbal medicine to alleviate the health conditions of the poor. It conducted seminars and workshops for doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and biology students. Members went to far-flung communities conducting seminars with local healers and, co and other community members. Jessica disappeared on 31 July 1977 with six others. Unfortunately, her body uh, have yet to be found. Raquel Edralin Tiglao. Raquel studied for an AB psychology degree at the University of the Philippines. In the late 1960s, she joined the militant student group Kabataang Makabayan and became involved in the anti-Marcos activities, often at a frontliner at rallies and demonstrate, demonstrations. When martial law was declared, Raquel found her name in the wanted list and she decided to quit her studies and go underground. Later, she was captured together with her husband and then charged with sedition and rebellion. The couple, together with, her do with their daughter, Ria, was kept in prison for almost two years. And after the release, they were placed under house arrest. Uh, Raquel tried to resume her studies in UP, but the constant military surveillance bothered her. She quit college the second time around. She went organize, on organizing communities, providing psychological counseling, and keeping in touch with her activist friends. In the early 1980s, she helped put up a community daycare center for children, for, for, for children of political activists, becoming its chief officer for two years. She gave Lamas childbirth instructions to activist couples. Raquel took up women's rights issues when the women's movement saw a resurgence in the 1980s. She took courses in psychology and women's studies, joining her husband Bobby, who was on a Harvard fellowship in 1987. She helped put up a women's center intended for military rape survivors. She became the center's consultant and trainer, and later executive director for 10 years. She steered the women's crisis center into the country's premier hospital-based and crisis care facility for women victims, survivors of gender-based violence. She spent the rest of her life dedicated to pursuing women's issues and concerns. She died in 2001 after a long battle with cancer. I actually don't, don't know how to end this tragic series of tragic narratives. But in a way, I would like to propose three prospects postscripts. Um, there were other doctors who uh, met um, after the uh, ouster of Marcos, and this is the first postscript. The medical action group met from May 19 to 28, 1986, and issued what was, and I think still is, a very important document in the medical community uh, engagement called the People's Health Manifesto with the declaration of principles health as human right as a human right the attainment and maintenance of health is the responsibility of society national economic and social development is essential for the healthcare system to be responsive to the needs of the country state policy in health must be guided by the principles of social justice and equity it is the state's responsibility to initiate, encourage, and sustain intersectoral efforts towards achievement of health for all. Remember, it was during the time of the ouster and a lot of you know, initiatives were being pushed uh, for social reform and transformation. It was actually a 10-point uh, program. Um, critical of uh, the marketization of health delivery system and uh, 
the foregrounding of service as uh, the guiding principle for the healthcare uh, system. They also had general recommendations to enshrine health as a basic human right in the Philippine Constitution, the reorganization of the Ministry of Health, the top priority for increasing health budget, full support for primary health care, and uh, the drawing up of uh, health care plans, among others. They also have specific recommendations on the quality of work-life conditions for health workers, rationalizing the drug policy, economics of health care, a statement on the hospitals in crisis, and ensuring uh, pe uh, people's health and safety. Postscript number two, the continuing repression and struggle. I, I would like to sh uh, share two narratives that happened after the ouster of Marcos, the case of Morong 43. The armed forces of the Philippines deployed around 300 men, a battalion, to arrest um, Morong 43 in the morning of February 6, 2010. The health workers were handcuffed, blindfolded, and held in isolation for days. When they had to answer nature's call, they were each led by a military officer who pulled down their underwear for them. They were interrogated and denied sleep for them. Representatives from the government's Commission on Human Rights were even denied entry to the camp where they were detained. Um, um, the, A the AFP or the Armed Forces of the Philippines claimed that the 43 health workers were arrested in a farmhouse owned by a doctor, Dr. Melesha Velmonte, uh, and were accused to be New People's Army guerrillas, undergoing a training in bomb making. It also claimed that soldiers found bomb making materials, guns, and claymore mines under the beds, in quotes, of the health workers. The military struck to this claim even when it was revealed that among those arrested were doctors and healthcare professionals, one of them a senior citizen and another a midwife. When the Supreme Court, Court ordered the military to produce the detained health workers, the military initially refused, adding another lie that the military supposedly discovered a plan for, by the NPA to spring the detainees from jail. The second case of Dr. Nati Castro. Nati Castro was spent more than two decades in the communities of Northern Mindanao, helping communities in need. In March 24, uh, 25, uh, an Agusan del Sur court junk the kidnapping case against Castro, this was in 2019, who is the Secretary General of Carapatan, or human rights, in the region. The, ca the court found it offensive to due process that a preliminary investigation was done without subpoena. The 53-year-old community doctor was arrested in her home in San Juan City uh, during this year, she was a graduate of the UP College of Medicine. Uh, as a student, she treated patients at the P Philippine General Hospital where she witnessed those who have the least in life. After she graduated at the UP in 1996, Castro dedicated her life serving the poor communities and the ethnic communities of the LUMAD, uh, or the National Minorities of Mindanao. As a former Secretary General of the Human Rights Organization, Karapatan, she was among the delegates of the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland, to bring attention to the, flight, to the fight of the indigenous peoples' communities of the LUMAD. Unfortunately, she was terror, terrorist tagged. Uh, based on the Anti-Terror Council Resolution of the Government, number 35. The resolution dated December 7, 2022, stated that based on evidence they have gathered, supposedly, there is probable cause warranting the de designation of Castro as a terrorist individual. Castro was first arrested in their home in February 2022 for allegedly being a ranking member of the Communist Party. She was then slapped with a trumped up uh, charges of kidnapping and serious illegal detention. In March 2022, the Agusan del Sur trial court junk discharges. Castro was able to walk out of detention 40, years af uh, 40 days after spending uh, uh, in jail 
But in, as I said, in June of 2022, she was. The court reversed the initial dismissal of charges, and uh, was, Castro was then tagged a terrorist. Castro is known as a community doctor and an advocate for human rights, as well as the struggles of the Lumad peoples in northeastern Mindanao. For more than two decades, Castro dedicated her time to serving the poor communities in Mindanao. The case is still pending in court right now. Finally, for the last postscript, this is really trying to, I was trying to put forward, you know, what should be the voice of uh, this series of narratives. And if you're familiar with Humans of New York, we have the equivalent Humans of Pinas. And one of the featured article was the essay written by Dr. Sylvia De La Paz, the widow of Bobby. And I would like to read portions of this uh, in her first person tone. She said, I lost a husband. Our two and a half year old son lost a father. I gained an insight on fascism, the harsh nature of the state, respecting no one who sides with the poor, deprived and oppressed masses who have chosen to serve. I also learned how many others, having found a more meaningful life in service to the people, got into the crosshairs of government forces bent on maintaining power at all costs. I met political detainees, torture survivors, workers on strike, urban poor being evicted from their homes, and people in, in picket lines and rallies, all struggling for a better life but found themselves behind bars, made to disappear involuntarily or summarily killed. I, made, I, I met grieving families looking for justice for their loved ones, in organizations for victims and survivors of various forms of political repression that were all meant to create a chilling effect and shatter people's lives into action. Bobby's family helped uh, set up organization for health and human rights. I met lawyers and fellow physicians who showed me what human rights were and how health as a right cannot be attained without, without also striving for the right to food security, water, shelter, education, and fair wages, among others. Thus, we would train health workers to render first aid during mass protest actions for these legitimate concerns. More lessons were for me to learn how our resilience as a people back then for 21 years of the U.S.-backed Mar Marcos dictatorship allowed us to tolerate many injustices but eventually steeled Filipinos to awaken and move forward, joining the people's movement to finally oust Marcos. The day of reckoning came in February of 1986 when we joined millions of people mass up in EDSA along military tanks, vendors selling peanuts, nuns praying rosaries, college girls in short shorts, arms linked with the peasants, workers, and a motley of opposition fo forces some of whom eventually proceeded to shake the gates of Malacanang, the palace, demanding the ouster of Marcos. The biggest lesson learned, and I think this was Sylvia speaking, but actually the others should have spoken as well, was that tyranny ends when people unite never to be defeated. Thus, the, the U.S.-backed Marcos martial law ended with the EDSA People Power Revolt. However, after centuries of colonization, a national democratic revolution is still continuously being waged. As history moves forward, so do we, this time armed with memories of lessons from past victories and past defeats towards our vision of a society wherein people have no cause or inclination to inflict harm on each other, lest we forget we must never allow martial law ever again. So to conclude the paper, I would like to present this as an alternative of viewing history of medicine as a his people's history of medicine with its multiple narratives based on the idea of community health from the community to the community from the perspective of the global south. The idea of medicine from below, people's health agenda of health as a human right.
Maraming salamat. Thanks for listening. Okay. Thank you very much. You have to stay there. Yes, yes. Because just <laughs> we have some time for questions. Last thing. Okay. Uh, I think that it is, is, it is very interesting uh, discussion, very interesting topic that you know that Mark was at uh, the same time with Suharto. Yes. But I think that about the meditation policy, Suharto and Mark are different. Mm. Uh, would you like to tell me about the role of military in petition activities in Philippines? But in Indonesia, the, the military is very important to uh, uh, to help uh, help care upon the uh, ordinary people in Indonesia, mm -hmm. especially in the outer island. Mm -hmm. Okay, please. Yes, um, there is a medical. Uh, I'm not exactly sure about the exact term. The medical. Uh, wing of the armed forces of the Philippines and they were maintaining um, they were maintaining the uh, Viluna me, uh, Military Doctors Hospital um, as well as the Veterans Memorial Hospital for military veterans but majority of the clientele were soldiers injured in battle or military veterans who were uh, retired already and in need of medical care. So majority of the um, mobilization for medical programs were done by civilian doctors. Uh, unfortunately, they were very few and quite underfunded. Um, but the military hospitals were relatively uh, better funded that, than the civilian hospitals. And they had, of course, the benefits uh, as military personnel or retired officers, they can uh, be treated for free, unlike in the other hospitals when even in public hospitals, they had the, the civilians had to pay if the facilities are available and present. So, okay. so it's quite different. Thank you. I think the next time you can make a comparative to Yes, yes, that, that, that's very interesting. Would you like to tell me about the health service between common, different communities in Muslim area, communist area, and Christian area? <laughs> um, As in Mindanao, in uh, Luzon, and this is a Christian area, Muslim area, and communist, communist community. Would you, would you like to tell me about the health service and differences uh, yeah. Maybe we can discuss it according to sectors. The government initiated hospitals uh, were mostly concentrated in the urban centers. There were provincial centers as well, but if you go to the far flung communities, uh, the villages or the barangays were left out with uh, minimal healthcare system. And th there was, of course, this void that uh, were in need to be filled up, you know, and hence the, the need for some of the activist doctors to come into uh, play. Particularly because, well, there's not really, there was not really very many of them. Uh, I, I mentioned the uh, uh, before the the problem of uh, labor out migration, particularly for professional health workers and those who stayed remained in Manila. So those who opted to go to the rural areas uh, where medical care facilities were lacking or the medical health care professionals were either absent or their presence were minimized. Uh, they were suspected as communist sympathizers. Um, primarily because these uh, poor communities uh, logically also became the centers of communist activities. You know, uh, a lot of resistance also came uh, as a result of, you know, um, massive poverty being experienced by the communities and the neglect from government. Uh, so you have 
uh, volunteer professionals and healthcare workers or those who were applying alternative medical practices in the mountains of the Cordillera in the north, uh, where most of the ethnic communities, non-Christian communities were located, as well as in the south, you know, where the Lumad and Moro peoples were located. Even up to now, this, this, the case of Dr. Nati Castro, uh, who used to be based in the University of the Philippines, uh, Philippine General Hospital in Manila, but transferred to Mindanao to serve the ethnic communities of the Lumans. She was suspected of you know, harboring sympathies with the communists and therefore was terrorist, uh, considered as a terrorist. Um, in the 1970s, two major movements uh, regarding that uh, uh, pushed forward the um, Moro people's rights uh, were established, the Moro National Liberation Front and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front later on. Uh, they had their own wing of uh, medical professionals operating in the area, but um, unfortunately I was not able to find substantial document um, for the obvious reason that it's an underground organization. They, do, they don't document where they are, who they were, uh, but there were reports that there were, that there were doctors uh, as well. Uh, I'm not exactly sure if local concepts, both either Maguindanao, Maranao, or Tausug, and Islamic concepts played in the, in the delivery of medical uh, services um, that's sensitive of the conditions and the mental state of, of the people, the religious uh, orientation as well. I'm not exactly sure about that and I don't have data on that, sorry. Thank you. Anderson has a question. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Francis. It was a very moving and illuminating address and it's a fine start to the conference I think. Thank you for that. Uh, it, it, it did make me uh, wonder whether uh, this is a distinctive Philippine story or whether the same sort of activist uh, doctors and others in the medical field could be found say in Indonesia and uh, Thailand and other places across Southeast Asia in this period. Uh, it may be more about that. Uh, as the conference proceeds. Uh, but the question I had really is the impact of other developments internationally uh, that shaping the views of these uh, activist uh, makers. Uh, for example, uh, social medicine. Do they use the term social medicine? Um, uh, Alma Ata, Almati, that declaration was not 1978. Mm -hmm. I noticed there was a reference in one of the documents you showed of health for all. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder whether they were responding in a sense to uh, the Almaty Declaration. Uh, and also the emphasis on acupuncture mm -hmm. uh, made me think of Chinese barefoot doctors mm -hmm. and the influence of uh, China. So I just wonder whether this is part of a larger international activism uh, around mm. what can be called social medicine. Yeah. Um, social medicine was um, not often mentioned in the documents. What I, I do found as consistently being cited is the concept of people's medicine. Of And it may have um, blurred boundaries between social medicine and people's health and people's medicine, right? The idea was that knowledge was not um, um, monopolized by Western-oriented, academically trained medical professionals, and knowledge can be generated from the community as well, particularly when I referred to the knowledge about herbal medicine and medical practices of the community. But suffice it to say, it was also the recognition that you know, um, medical care was lacking, if not totally absent in these communities. Hence the need to find alternative ways of delivering health care and acupuncture became part and parcel of this. That's readily available, very mobile, uh, 
you know, easy to learn perhaps. I, I, I don't know about acupuncture, but from you know, what I learned, one can easily be, get the training from, for acupuncture um, a, at a relatively shorter period of time compared to you know, being trained as an MD, for example. Um, and community, community health workers uh, became more and more open to that. Um, to some, it's the only medical facility in the community available. Um, maybe it's the influence of the Chinese, but maybe it's also the realization that there should be um, a need to find alternatives out there. You know, um, regarding the Almaty uh, Almaatak uh, declaration, I, I think some of the doctors who constituted the medical action group were also influenced by that. Now, remember the the date of the document was 1986, so it was what eight years or so give or take, after the declaration. And some of them were really uh, 